It is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Today's speaker is Kit Waltzlin. Begin public speaking at age nine. He has a little bit more experience than I do. In 4-H, he's, by 16, he organized, facilitated presentations on leadership, citizenship, community service, and motivation for the 4-H and fu future farmers of America. A little bit of rural blood in this gentleman. Kit has a bachelor's degree in speech communication, business administration, political science. He's earned an MA degree in speech communication and business administration. Kit's purchased his first manufacturing company at the age of 21 and by 26 was CEO and chairman and board of three manufacturing companies in three states. He's been an instructor for the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities and has been repeatedly nominated outstanding faculty. He is a professional member of the National Speakers Association. Ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome Kit Walsman. Uh, thank you, Todd. Thank you for that, that flattering introduction. My goodness, after an introduction like that, I, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> I should keep a copy of that, so the next time somebody says, hey, who do you think you are? Something I can tell them. Great to be here working with you. A couple of things I'd like to clarify as we get started. Todd mentioned that I began public speaking at the age of nine. That was not out of desire. Uh, that was out of necessity. You see, when I grew up in that hog and dairy farm in southern Minnesota, I was the youngest of four sons, no sisters. And I grew up in a position-centered family. Not a person-centered family where everyone would have an equal say or an equal vote. There was a true hierarchy in the family where my dad had the most authority, then my mom, and then it went from oldest to youngest, and, and I was the youngest. So what would happen around the dining room table is my dad would say something, then my mom would say something, then... Cabot, Kelly, Corey, and then they changed the subject. And I always had a terrible time getting into the conversation, but in 4-H, I could get up in front of a club once a month and give a five or ten minute speech without interruption, and well, I really haven't stopped since. Then I went to school at Mankato State, became a college dropout. I left college after my junior year when that little manufacturing company came up for sale in my hometown. And the reason the business was for sale is because the gentleman that had started the company in 1972 had already suffered a massive heart attack by 1983, so it looked like something I should get involved with. <laughs> and so I negotiated at his bedside, ended up buying his company. I was the youngest employee, had no technical expertise. I was the chief executive officer and $450,000 in debt. I mean, really, really getting places quickly. $450,000 was a lot of money back in 83. Still a lot of money today. But I had a business mentor that told me, Kit, if you owe the bank $50,000, you're in trouble. If you owe the bank $500,000, they're in trouble. <laughs> so be careful when you pick your mentors. Uh, but things did turn out just fine. The company did grow to three companies. Left those companies back in 1989 to do this, to give seminars and workshops. All the years we were growing those companies, we used to run to Mankato or Sioux Falls or Spencer, Iowa, anywhere Career Track or Dale Carnegie or SkillPath were offering seminars. And we found that we could go there for a few hours and learn some information we could apply for a few years. And that's the type of information I want to share with you today, information that will work if you put it to work, information, frankly, that's backed up from here until next week with research. It's not something that came to me in a dream in the middle of the night. But I just want to forewarn you, I'm going to make a lot of suggestions and I'm not necessarily going to give you advice. I tend not to run around uh, giving people advice and the main reason I'm not going to give you advice, frankly, is, well, Socrates was a man who went around giving people good advice and I understand they, they, they poisoned him. So <laughs> I'm going to make a lot of suggestions though. But we're going to spend about an hour together to take a look at what's going on when it comes to change and chaos and how to become a quick change artist. Because I don't know if you've noticed, but it doesn't seem like things are really slowing down and maybe the economy seems kind of slow or the recession or a warm winter make budgets kind of tight. But it doesn't really seem like things are slowing down. If we take a look over the last hundred years, what has been the accelerated pace of change to our lifetime? And it's common now, I would say, for people to live to 100. 
I, my parents gave me, it must be a lifetime subscription to the Plain Dealer, the small town paper uh, that came out of the town we lived nearby. And there was a couple in there celebrating their 80th wedding anniversary. 80 years of bliss. <laughs> he was 102, she was 99, so he's robbing the cradle. But uh, <laughs> 80 years, 100 years old. How much has their life changed when it comes to technology and information in that 100 years? Now, in a great book called High Performance Living by Dr. Ken Dykewald, he says you might think it might be, I don't know, accelerated pace of change five times faster than it was 100 years ago, maybe 15 times faster. The estimate is around 50 times faster. My father grew up on a farm in southern Minnesota. He did not get electricity on the farm until after he got home from World War II. My father went through country school by candlelight. My first three years of my education were in a country school. I had a big class, too. Timmy Kanak was in my class. Penny Lehman was in my class. We had a class of three. But my parents bought a farm three quarters of a mile down the road, and class size uh, went from three to two. The entire enrollment for those six grades went from 13 to 12. And we moved to three quarters of a mile away down the road, and I had to go to town school. And I remember the phone call I had on the party line with Timmy Kanak as he was sobbing, saying, I may not ever see you again. And I said, well, Timmy, I, th I think we can ride an extra three quarters of a mile on our bikes and still go down to the Watanwan River but not tell our parents that's where we went because they'd be worried. And then have to tell Debbie Durheim to get off the phone. <laughs> Debbie loved to listen to the party line. You'd hear her breathing, Debbie, get off the phone. She'd be silent, click. Technology. It is said that well over 80% of the world's technological advances have occurred since 1900. The first practical industrial robot was introduced in the 1960s. By 1982, there are about 20,000 robots being used in manufacturing. Now, when I was in manufacturing in the 80s, we used to have a rule that we would follow that you would not invest in automated equipment or robotics unless that machine would replace at least seven jobs because unless it didn't replace at least seven jobs, just keep paying the payroll because by the time you got the capital investment back, technology would have changed anyway. Today, there's over 20 million robots used in manufacturing in this country. And if we use that same old multiplier factor, and it's much higher today than it was 25 years ago, but 20 million robots, seven jobs per robot, that's 140 million jobs that have been replaced in this country through robotics. That's more full-time jobs than exist in this country. Tremendous changes in technology. I never did figure out the abacus. I remember you know, fooling around with that thing. But now I have access to information that just a click of a button just with my smartphone. And that information, you know, reaching far more people faster, of course, more change. So for the next hour, we're going to be talking about the impact that technology, information, and people have when it comes to chaos and change. So we're going to spend about an hour on that. As I was driving over here from the hotel, my oldest brother, he's a police officer, called me. And he says, hey, you want to meet for coffee? I said, I, he hates that stereotype about police officers having coffee. But whenever he calls me, he wants to meet for coffee. And I said, no, I'm actually driving through Ames, Iowa at the moment. What are you doing in Ames, Iowa? I said, I have a speech this morning. How long are you presenting for? I said, I'll be, I'll be uh, speaking for about an hour. And his response was, who can listen to you for an hour? Now, I'm going to guess over the last 20 years, uh, he has probably said that, oh, I don't know, 500, maybe 600 times. He still thinks it's funny. <laughs> so I guess in a way, some things don't change. But isn't it funny when we think about change? And you go back to your class reunion, and you might be back there for your 25th or 30th or 35th class reunion, and it's last call at 1 o'clock at the Legion Club or down at the Eagles Club, and somebody comes up to you, and they're half in the wind, and they say, oh, you know what? It was great. And you, you haven't changed a bit. And you just can't hardly believe it. Yeah, you, know, you, you went to school, you continued your education, went into the energy, energy industry, you were married, maybe divorced, you have kids, you have grandchildren, and, and then they say, you haven't changed a bit, and you just can't hardly believe it. But there is something called the residual self. Out of about the 400 self-concepts that we have, about 150 of them simply don't change. And so in a way, they're right. You haven't changed a bit. 
But this last Saturday, I went and golfed with some dear old friends at the old country club that I grew up at, and then went to the old county fair. I thought it was bigger than that when I was a kid. I kept thinking there must be something missing as I walked up and down the midway, and I'm thinking, no, there used to be something else here. And Man, it really is different, and I don't think I really want to go back to the county fair anymore every year. And then I went golfing with my dear old friends, and I saw the pictures, and I put on Facebook, because of course now, you know, got to be doing that. And I looked at that picture, and I thought, who are these old guys I went golfing with? We changed. A lot has happened in the last 30 years of our careers. Tremendous change. So we're going to take a look at what are, what's the difference between change and chaos and transition. Well, change is external. Change is overnight. Change as you come to work, and there's some new mandate or some new regulation, some new policy, some new procedure. Might be somebody new that's been hired. Change can happen quickly. Change sometimes. We didn't have any influence, any impact. Just kind of a victim of it. And then transition, though, is how we personally respond to that. It's kind of the anxiety. It's kind of like knocking ourselves on our heels and kind of catching our breath in a way. It's kind of shocking. It's kind of startling. Somewhat stressful. Even the changes we want, somewhat stressful. So what we're going to do is get through that transition faster. So a couple of different ways we can look at change and transition. Maybe it was a, a change when you moved into your first supervisory or crew leader or management position. Now, it seems kind of awkward at first, seems kind of phony for a while. The people you used to work elbow to elbow with, it seems like there's a little pushback when you ask them to do something and, ooh, you got a title now, you know, kind of stuff. But then over the next couple of weeks, over the next couple of months, sometimes over the next couple of years, people really can't remember when you weren't their manager or supervisor. Or maybe you moved to a, a different home, bought a different house. And you know when you've moved, if you've ever moved, it's exhausting. And, 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 and so the only piece of furniture you put back together is the bed because you want a good night's rest and you're just about ready to fall asleep. And that person you, know, you live with, here's, here's a car drive by. And they say, did you, did you hear that car? And, and, you, and you say, yeah, I, I, I did, I heard that car. Do you, th do you think it's in our driveway? No, no, I, I don't think it's in our driveway. Would you look? Okay, so we, we get out of bed and we go over to the window and we, we look out in the window. No. There's no car in the driveway, and so we go and lay down in bed again. We're just about ready to fall back to sleep, and, and then uh, all of a sudden there's a creak in the house, and the person you live with looks at did you hear that noise? Did you hear that creak? Yeah, yeah I, I, I did. Do, do you think there's somebody in the house? No, no, I don't. Would you go check? Okay. So you, you get out of bed, and you walk into every room, and you stop at every threshold and doorway, and you try to recreate that creak, and you can't, and you come back to bed, no, there... Nobody in the house, and you're just about ready to fall asleep. All of a sudden, there's a little whistle in the window. And the person goes, do you, do, you, do you hear that whistle in the window? Yeah, I do. Do you think we have rotten windows? Do you think we're going to have to put in new windows? No, I, I don't. I, I think the windows are fine. But then in a couple of months or so, you go to bed, and you, and you sleep like a baby, waking up every two hours screaming. You, know? but <laughs> you go to bed, and you sleep all night. You know, guess what? Cars are still driving by. House is still creaking. And that whistle in the window is kind of nice because it kind of drowns out the other noises. You've gone through the transition. I'm kind of amazed, really, when you take a look at technology and information and people, how quickly the changes and transitions need to occur. I have a 13-year-old daughter that, you know, it was less than a year ago when she was 12, adored me. Now as a 13-year-old with her phone and text messaging, I don't think she has quite enough enthusiasm in our relationship to even ignore me. <laughs> and I think, wow, what a change, you know? So everything in our relationship is somewhat temporary, kind of experimenting, hey, would you like to do this? Would you like to, would you like to jump in the car and go along? I mean, and sometimes it feels like I'm just running into a wall, and then I, ooh, you know, catch my breath, run into a wall and catch my breath. And, and that change and that transition in our personal relationships. Just last week, my wife, who's been a commercial lender for a family-owned bank that's been owned by the same family for three generations, went to the lender's meeting. She's a commercial lender, a business banker, on Wednesday morning, and she knew something was up because there was you know, requests for documents and some sort of internal audit going on. And they announced that their bank was being purchased by another larger family-owned bank. And this is Wednesday morning, and Wednesday after work from 5 to 7, the new leadership group will be in town and you're expected to come to that reception. So we had things already scheduled like I'm sure all of you do, you know, for when the 
kids activities to the next or your personal and professional life and so we're scrambling so she can make sure she gets to meet the new chief executive officer the new chief financial officer the other members of the leadership team and so that was on Wednesday and they assured them very little would change on Monday the president of the bank stops by her office and hands her a non-compete clause uh, if she wants to have an employment contract with the new bank and it's just like wow change and then transition how do we respond to it and then when you have those personal professional changes and transitions and they all seem to happen at once it can lead to chaos it just seems like everything's out of control you're minding your own business there's a tornado you're minding your own business there's a some sort of a flood you're minding your own business there's some sort of explosion some sort of a leak all of a sudden it can be chaos but hopefully with the techniques that I will share with you it'll be change we'll go through the transition and we'll lead change rather than be a victim of it that's the hope so let's take a look at the stages of change first stage of change and transition is it starts with an ending problem is we don't like endings <laughs> It's kind of nice to come to work, be completely confident, to be completely competent, to know what we're going to do, to have it all laid out, and to have that kind of, a, I guess, self-confidence in what we do. And then something changes. Now, people really don't like change. And we gotta take a look in that transition of what's called the neutral zone. Can't go back to the way it used to be. Not quite sure how it's going to be. It's kind of like nighttime between yesterday and tomorrow. And that's where, whether it's chaos or change, Pretty much everything needs to be temporary. You're going to be reorganizing, downsizing, right-sizing, ostracizing, whatever people think it is or feel that it is. You know, the first thing people look at is the organizational chart to see if their name is still on it. Mm -hmm. Then they kind of wonder, why am I over here? I used to be over, over here. And they go through that kind of transition. But in that neutral zone, you know, people are kind of anxious. Motivation drops about 50%. Absenteeism triples. Accidents occur because of the stress. And we're going to take a look at stress, because if you don't get through the stress of it, you're not going to get through the change. And then we have to launch a new beginning. We have to say, well, we're going to have to put on our big girl pants and our big boy pants, and we're going to have to head off in this direction to make it happen. But it always seems to create some anxiety, because there is a gamble. I mean, it is a gamble. It might not work. One of the seminars I deliver quite often is a presentation on problem solving and decision making. And I always get this pushback on one of the models that I share where I say, well, once you make the decision, then you schedule when you're going to review and evaluate the process of the decision and the product. So you're going to give it a couple of weeks, give it a couple of months. You're going to meet again to modify the decision. And people say, well, shouldn't we take more time to make sure we make the best decision? I said, you did take the time to make the best decision. But you know this, even the perfect ideas, the great decisions, once you put them in practice, there's all sorts of things that happen you couldn't have dreamed of. And so why spend all that time trying to come up with a perfect solution where we need to get it in the field, we need to get it on the ground, we need to get on it to get the feedback to polish that decision. So there's always kind of a gamble it might not work. Yeah. But through all of it, you need to take care of yourself. And taking care of yourself is to try to figure out what's really changing for you, too. Could have been a dream that you had, motivated you in your career. There was a position that you picked out 20 years ago that you thought, I'm gonna work my way up the ladder, work my way through the ranks, and I'm gonna get that position someday. And then we have a soft economy or a recession or a warm winter, and you know what? When that person retired, they decided not to fill that position. It's just gonna be eliminated. So it could have been a dream that you had. It could have been your, oh, I don't know, belief in the value that you provided to the organization. In the introduction, Todd mentioned I'd been nominated outstanding faculty for the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities a few times. It was kind of a funny deal. Back, back in 1993, I was asked to join the faculty at the college where I picked up my master's degree just two years earlier. And the reason they invited me to teach is they had an experimental class that had 350 students in a room. So, you know, about uh, about two-thirds the size of this group, where 8 o'clock I'd teach a class, 9 o'clock I'd teach a class, 10 o'clock I'd teach a large lecture class on communication skills, and then on Friday I'd have a class that would go for four straight hours, same classroom. So I was teaching, you know, more than 1,000 students a quarter. Had 12 graduate students that took care of the paperwork. The reason they hired me is because if it didn't work, they could blame me. If it did work, they could take credit 
for how well designed the course was. So I taught that cl class that fall, nominated outstanding faculty. Taught the class winter, nominated outstanding faculty. Ca taught the class spring, nominated outstanding faculty. Taught it two summer sessions, bang, bang, uh, outstanding faculty. I resigned, thinking they'd beg me back. They did, so I taught the class again for the next three quarters. I resigned again, this time to try to negotiate a better contract, and they just hired somebody else. Well, she taught the class in the fall, and uh, she was nominated outstanding faculty too. <laughs> and uh, in the winter quarter also. And uh, I thought it was me, maybe part of it, but it was really, it was a well-designed class. I mean, it was a really good textbook. It was a really good workbook. And it really worked well to have graduate students, nearly the same age as the traditional students, working with them one-on-one. -on -one. But it was kind of a, <laughs> kind of a hit to my ego about the value that I would provide. Sometimes it's a belief that you have about the leader of your organization. That we always were at the cutting edge of technology and we're going to hold off on that for a couple of years. Or we always seem to put safety first and all of a sudden it seems like, really, you're, you're, you're considering doing that without considering safety first? So sometimes it's the belief we had about the leader. When I got into manufacturing in, in 83, the I asked everybody to bring in their employee guidebooks and handbooks. It was like a 27-page book of rules and how to conduct yourself and how to act around there. I said, bring all those in, you know, by Friday. And we met in the inspection room. That's the only room that was big enough for everybody. And I stacked them up, and I slid them off the table, and I threw them into a big old garbage can. And I said, OK, now what we need to do is come up with just one sheet of paper, and we'll just post it up there by the time clock of how we're supposed to act. And I do reserve the right, though, if I hired somebody I shouldn't have, we might have to add a couple of things so I can get rid of them. But, you know, let's try to keep it just a single sheet. And I need four of you to join me, you know, to you know, kind of write that up. And so by the time I left there, six years later, we did have two pages because I, I did make a couple of bad hires and it took a little while, you know, to work that through the system. But we were still able to conduct business with just a couple of uh, pages of principles of, of good professional behavior. But you have to mark those endings sometimes. Not going to go back to the way it used to be. This is the way it, it's going to be. And so you've got to have the courage to, to take the action. But the part of it, as far as believing in the leader of the company, that first day I told them my goal is we'll have five companies in five states over the next 10 years. Each company, the way I track it out, will be about 110 miles apart. I believe we'll be able to control the market. We'll charge as much as we can. I'll pay you as much as I can. But I need five people that are going to be willing to take over those plants over the next 10 years. So start getting ready because there's going to be, we had three companies in three states in six years, and I realized, wrong plan. Wrong plan. And it's kind of a sad day when you're telling people that have invested six years of their lives to be prepared to make the next step that, you know, I've been chanting, we're going west, we're going west, we're going west, and then one day say, actually, you know what, uh, we're not going to go west, and I'm going to go northeast. And there's a couple of people that will be replacing my responsibilities here, but since we're not headed that direction, I'm not the person to lead it, and we're going to be unwinding from this. And I still think there's a few people that are still angry about it. I did see Willie when I was back in my 30-year class reunion and walked into the Eagles Club, and I waved, and he goes, hey, Welchland, yes, yeah, OB. <laughs> so I think he's... But I went over to Willie, put my arm around him, ground my fist in his shoulder, and I said, how you doing, Willie? I'm doing all right. I said, what are you doing these days? He's still, he's still out at the shop. Still out at the shop. So when it comes to that belief you have in the leader, you know, sometimes they, they can disappoint us. Sometimes uh, we've invested uh, that we'd follow them through fire. And then sometimes they change their mind. And it could be your understanding or the image of yourself, your sense of competence, your identity. Most of us in this room are men. And so much of our self-concept is what we do. When I give seminars on communication between men and women, one of the things that's so noticeable is the difference between the way women have conversations and the way men have conversations. Women tend to talk about who they are in their conversations. Men tend to talk about what they do. And sometimes my wife and I will be at a networking event, whether it's at her bank or the National Speakers Association, and she'll be talking with someone, and then she'll come back, and I say, so, so what do they do? Oh, I don't know, but they have three kids like us and about the same age. And I'm like, so what, 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 what's their career? What do, what do they do? She goes, that didn't come up. And, and I'm like, well, how am I going to start a conversation with them? <laughs> so finally, I just give up and say, what do you do for a living? Oh, I do this. Oh, my nephew does that. Or, oh, yeah, one of my favorite people is an accountant. I mean, sometimes, we, you know, for men, what we do is who 
we are. So when there's change, it really kind of stumps us in a way because the fear is, what about if I don't make it through it? What about if I look incompetent? What about if I don't catch on fast enough? What about if this technology, I'm not really prepared or I'll look foolish? I think Cubby used to talk about this all the time. Two circles in life, the great big old circle called the circle of concern. And then a little bitty circle inside called the circle of influence. What we can actually do something about. One of those circles of concern is employment. And when somebody comes out of the office or you get some letter or some announcement or a memo that says there's going to be some changes around here, people gasp and gulp because they think what? Oh, no. Somebody's going to what? Lose their job. If somebody's going to lose their job. If I lost my job, oh, my God, I might lose my house. So property is the second one. It always breaks our heart if there's a tornado that rips through a town or a flood that wipes out a family's home. I mean, it just breaks your heart to see that, whether it's in Omaha or in other states or see lives swept away. So if I lose my job and I lose my home, what will people think? And that's reputation, the vital reputation. And we've all known people with a great reputation. And then one dumb decision, one dumb act, and it all disappears. And what's the first thing we ask? What were they thinking? That's a great question. What were they thinking? Because I tell you what, they make a bad decision, they blow it, people will never forget it. It's a simple example. My wife and I have always bought old houses and fixed them up. And it was home number 15, and we were moving an antique bedroom set that we bought on the other side of downtown St. Paul on Summit Avenue, which is the high rent district there. And it bought, they've got a great deal, though. Oh, man, we got a good deal. And it had uh, on every piece of the bedroom furniture, 1886 carved in the back. It had the family name, not our name, somebody else's name, but it had the family name carved in there. And my wife and I are moving the first piece of furniture into our Victorian home on the east side of St. Paul up on Dayton's Bluff, which is not the high rent district. Anyway, bought that house for $30,000. And negotiated a buck ahead for the squirrels in the attic. That's how we bought that one. But anyway, I'm walking in carrying, I, I think it's called a vanity. It has a four little legs on each side, end of this thing. And then you have a mirror and you can sit on a stool and look at yourself. So we're carrying that in. My wife's going in backwards. And I said, now watch your elbow. And when I did that, I dropped my end just a little bit. And the front leg on my end caught the threshold going in the front door and snapped it off. I about threw up on that vanity. Here's a piece of furniture for 120 years had never been damaged, and we don't even have it in our house, and I snapped the front leg off of that vanity. Now I glued it, I put on you know, binders, I put on clamps. People claim that stay in the guest bedroom, oh, you can't even see it. Guess what's the first thing I see when I walk in the guest bedroom? <laughs> the big old crack on that front leg. It's kind of like if you ever made the mistake of sheetrocking your own house. Don't do it. Huh? Because you'll be sitting there at night watching TV and they go, see that line up there? I should have sanded that one more time. You know? Damn, it looks like you screwed plywood on the wall. You can just see every line. You know? oh, and, and your company says, oh, I can't see it. Really? Wait, look, come here. Let me turn on this lamp. Huh? Now can you see it? I mean, I mean, it's the same way with reputation. Everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But remember that one time. One time. So when it comes to our reputation as a leader, when it comes to our reputation as a manager, when it becomes a, there's no such thing as a false entrance or a false exit or, well, I don't know, you know, I'll see how it goes. Really? It's kind of like in customer service, you know. What do people hear when, uh, the, when they call your place of business and people answer the phone? And sometimes I'll have clients that say, well, it depends on who answers the phone. Oh, no. Really? The person that's representing everybody in the organization, first impressions within seconds, well, it depends on who answers the phone. Oh. So as a leader or manager, it depends if you feel like it. No. No, we've got to do better than that. We've got to lead it. We've got to set the standard of it. So it seems pretty simple, doesn't it? I mean, really. Okay, there's going to be a change. We've got to go through transition. The four stages are, okay, I've got to be prepared that things aren't going to be the way they used to be. So I've got to mark the endings. 
and then I got to go in the neutral zone where everything's temporary. I'll put you on a climate survey committee. I'll put you on some sort of transition monitoring team. I'll move you into learning some things. You can provide training. You know, you're going to do all these kind of adjustments to roles, responsibilities, and how we share information. And then we're going to launch a new beginning. Let's see how she goes, huh? All in. And then take care of ourselves. Seems pretty simple. But there's some mistakes we make. One of those mistakes is we fail to manage the stress. And if you don't manage the stress, you're not going to get through the change. Now, unfortunately, out of the 3,000 or so presentations I've delivered over the last 20 years, more than 600 times, I've delivered a seminar called STP, Stress, Time, and Procrastination Management. Stress management. And I have people in my industry that say, oh, people still hire you for stress management. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you what, when I'm delivering that seminar, which is just about always once a week, sometimes halfway through that seminar, I'm thinking to myself, my God, did I need this? I mean, it's constant stress, isn't it? Constant change. Now, there's three stages of stress, of course. The alarm stage, you come to work, oh, there's something new. And once we get to the alarm, and what'd you wake up to this morning? An alarm clock. What did our ancestors wake up to? A cow would moo, the sun would rise, chicken clock, you know, a roaster, crow maybe, you know. Yeah. But now we have an alarm clock, and then you get to work, and then there's something else alarming, there's some change, or some sort of chaotic event, or there's something wrong. And we go into the response stage, which is that fight or flight mechanism. You can feel the heart start to pound, the adrenaline start to rush, you start to pant, perspire. This is a gift we got from our ancestors, 50, 60,000 years ago. Let's say I was your ancestor. 50,000 years ago, and I'm outside today on a beautiful day in front of my cave. I have a little fire there, captured some sort of rat, rodent, or red meat in my diet. And I'm out enjoying the beautiful day. I'm a cave dweller with my beautiful wife, Mrs. Cave Dweller. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, in front of our cave, there jumps a mountain lion. Well, of course, I become alarmed. I have two options either fight or flee. So whether I wrestle the big old pussycat to the ground or I run through the jungle until I was safe. But researchers claim our ancestors would literally lay down and sleep 20 to 40 hours before they'd be back to homeostasis, the condition they're in physically and psychologically before the mountain lion jumped in front of the cave. Now that same stress response, that same survival mechanism is kicking in today, and it is. What's the problem with that equation? We're not getting the what? 20 to 40 hours of sleep every day. So let's say Todd's my, that's usually pretty funny. But anyway, let's say, <laughs> let's say Todd's my boss and I've been working on a handout, let's say for the last couple of weeks, I run around to buy Todd and so I say, Todd, what do you think of the handout? And he says, Kit, this is a pile of trash, you're a dork. Well, I become alarmed. I have two options, either to fight or flee. So let's say I decide to fight. So I dive across his desk, I wrestle him to the floor until he's unconscious. Then I lay on his floor for 20 to 40 hours straighten my tie and head back to my office. That's what I'm supposed to do. Well, he says, get this with a pile of trash, you're a dork. I become alarmed, so I decide to flee. So I run down the freeway or I run out to the parking lot, sleep in my truck for 20 to 40 hours, come back to work on Friday. That's what I'm supposed to do. But can I do that? Well, maybe once. So I'm going to have to figure out a better way to respond. Otherwise, I'm going to become burned out. And I'll tell you what, burnout isn't pretty. If you truly do become burned out because of the stress caused by change, it isn't something you recover from, from some four-day weekends through the summer or over the holidays. If you truly do become burned out, according to Dr. K.W. Center, it takes two to four years to recover from burnout. And I've never had anybody ever come up to me and say, oh, Kit, the years I was burned out, best years of my life. No, <laughs> they're the longest days of your life. Now there's three stages of burnout you need to be looking for. First is physical fatigue. Now I think the best way to tell you've hit that level of burnout is if you have a favorite TV program you like to watch and you don't have TiVo so you're gonna sit there and watch that thing real time and you're sitting there and to watch that TV show and there's a commercial break in about what three four minutes the next thing you realize you wake up it's 1 30 in the morning there's an infomercial on selling exercise equipment and you Wipe the drool off your chin, you find the remote control, shut off the TV, head down to the bedrooms to get a few more hours of sleep, you're exhausted. Second stage of burnout is psychological fatigue. Psychological fatigue is when some people get grumpy, some people get grouchy, some people go looking for a fight, some people withdraw from relationships. 
Often we all suffer from something called mindlessness or thoughtlessness. I think the best way to tell you've hit the second stage of burnout is you're on your way home from work and you think, oh, that's right, I was supposed to pick up a gallon of milk. And the next thing you realize, you pull up to the garage and you didn't have any milk. So you back out of the driveway, head down to the grocery store, and then you find yourself walking up and down the aisles of the grocery store trying to figure out, why am I in a grocery store? So <laughs> you grab some paper towels, they never go bad. <laughs> grab some toilet paper, can always use that. Get in the checkout line and look in somebody else's cart and they have milk. So you go back to the far corner of the store, grab your milk, walk out with $20 of other grocery items, and then pull into the parking lot at work again. Ah, you know, <laughs> and drive home. Mindlessness and thoughtlessness. OSHA says by this point, 16 days a year of work lost because of physical fatigue. People get sick, psychological fatigue because people get hurt. I was working with a public utility that had a great big concave mirror in their office area, and I said, how come you have that great mirror there, like a, a grocery store or a shopping mall? And they said, well, because we were really, it was really hectic here, and so a couple of people were running down the hallways, ran into each other, and then the ambulance had to come because one got really hurt. Yeah, they've got mindlessness and thoughtlessness. The last stage of burnout is spiritual fatigue, and that's a sense of hopelessness, helplessness, thoughts of escape. You don't like dealing with your customers anymore, those coworkers anymore, you're just sick of it. I think the best way to tell you if it's spiritual fatigue is, I'm not sure what the name of the TV show is, but there's a TV show that the whole TV show is a bunch of stories about people that have run away to another part of the country for five or 10 years and none of their family and friends can find them. And as you're watching that TV show, you're wondering if you could do that, if you could just <laughs> run away for five or 10 years, take all the cash you can find, credit cards, checks, they're too easy to trace, just take the cash. Now, it seems silly we'd call that burnout because who doesn't get tired every once in a while? I agree. And who doesn't get a little grumpy or grouchy every once in a while or walk into a room and can't remember why you're in that room? I agree. And who doesn't lose hope every once in a while? I agree. But if you truly do become burned out, it may take two to four years to recover. And it might be the most important two to four years of your relationship with your aging parents. It might be the most important two to four years with your kids. So I don't want you to become burned out. So you've got to figure out some ways to manage the stress. I don't know, go for a walk. That's what I do. It causes me to move, breathe, bend, because I take the dog along. How many know what I'm talking about? It's like having a Holstein heifer as a pet. But anyway, it's <laughs> the only part I don't enjoy. But it is at my pace. I get that done every day. You know, kids wanted a dog, but I'm going out walking the dog. But anyhow, it's what I need. And I notice the days that I'm away and I don't get to, I get a little bit grouchy, a little bit grumpy. My wife says, touchy. But anyway. So you got to have a way to burn it off with exercise. I give myself a nickname that I like. Don't go with the nickname other people have given you. Give yourself a nickname that you like. One time I was working with a large prison, a correctional facility on change, and they didn't want any. So I'm going to be in front of 400 correctional officers, two-day lockdown of a prison. Do any of you have family members that are correctional officers? I'll tell you what, pretty macho bunch. I thought they ate their young. I tell you. I'm going to the front of the room and I'm saying, come on, Welchie, let's go. Come on, Welchie, let's go. So the presentation spunk, it was Welchie's fault, not mine. <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting you should have a split personality, but you can manage a lot of stress if you do. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, when you're in a leadership position, when you're managing people and supervising, man, you know, you got to make some tough decisions. You have to enforce the rules. You have to step in, and it's uncomfortable. So what you need to do is give yourself a nickname that you like and say, of course, you wouldn't say Welchie, but come on, Welchie, let's go. And take some of the pressure off. It's a role that you're playing. It's required that you lead. And so take the pressure off. Make sure it's professional in your conduct. And then, of course, sometimes people join the anti-change crowd. They decide not to change. But I learned this a long time ago growing up on the farm. It's a lot easier to ride the horse in the direction it's headed. I don't know if you've ever been on a horse that wants to go back to the barn. It's going back to the barn. Okay, it's an 800-pound animal. You have the bit and bridle and some leather straps. And the more you slap it on the ears and cuss and swear, the more likely it's going to scrape you off on a tree or the barn door on the way in. So sometimes when the industry changes or when the organization needs to change, sometimes we just need to go along with it and ride the horse in the direction it's headed. But sometimes we'll act like a victim, we'll throw a pity party, invite everybody to attend to talk about how helpless we feel and how hopeless it is. Tell you what, it does not make you very attractive as a leader. 
And then also sometimes what we do is try to play the new game the old way. Use the same old approaches and procedures and processes instead of the new way. Let's say on break one of you told me that you're going to Chicago Thursday or Friday. I said, you're going to Chicago? And he, yep. I said, hey, I'll be right back. I've got a map of my SUV. And I come back and I hand you a map, and it's a map of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And he would say, kid, I'm going to Chicago. Yes, I know, major metropolitan area. That map should help. <laughs> but this is a map of Minneapolis and St. Paul. I know, it's a great map. I've been using it for 23 years. But kid, I'm going to Chicago. Yes, they have a freeway system there. They have water. I've seen it on an atlas. And you hand the map back to me and says, kid, I don't think this has any value for me. I'm offended by that. Because here's a tool I've been using for 23 years, and you flatly reject it that it no longer applies. And it's exactly what we do when it comes to change. I used to wear glasses until I had that laser surgery where they got Lasix or whatever. Oh, man, I can see like an eagle now. I'll be driving down the freeway and I say, hey, hawk, I can see ya, you know. And nothing on me. It's amazing. But for 30 years, I wore glasses. And Dr. Olson was always my doctor. Can you imagine if I went into the doctor's office? I'd doc, I said, I don't think I'm seeing clearly. I think I might need a new prescription. And he, you know, he puts me on those little oculars. Oh, those things, you know, click, 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 is that clearer? Uh, yeah, click, click, is that clearer? I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. You know. <laughs> Whatever got out of those things. <laughs> and he slides it away. And he says, you know what, you're right. You do need new glasses. I said, I thought so, Doc. And he says, but you've been such a good client of mine. I'll tell you what, Kit, you can have my glasses. And I go, what? He goes, go ahead and put them on. So I, I put on his glasses. I say, Doc, I can't see anything through your glasses. He says, try harder. Doc, I still can't see anything. You know, think positively. Yeah, positively, doctor. I can't see anything through the glasses. And that's the way we respond to change sometimes. Here's a new tool. Here's a new process. Here's a new way of doing it. Nah. We have to let go of the old so we can hang on to the new, launch that new beginning. And sometimes, of course, what happens is we request a low-stress work environment. We say, hey, can you take the pressure off? You know, sometimes we have to say that. I don't know. It might be the most cold-blooded thing they ever do. That means they're not going to keep the pressure on so you develop the skills and the talent you need to protect your career. Sometimes we try to control the uncontrollable, which is ridiculous. Sometimes what happens is we, you know, try to make some decisions about things that really we don't have any impact. I call it, you know, making a big deal out of little things. Really, you're going to stake your career on that. That brother of mine that I'd mentioned, you know, that says, uh, you know, who can listen to you for an hour? He's been a cop for 35 years. Never promoted. Never promoted. No facial hair. Always had this scuffy little mustache, you know. No hair on the collar. Always had this little bitty, little bitty ponytail or ducktail that just always, you know, just that little bit of, little bit of edge. They had a new software, you know, that would measure overtime hours. Uh, 0.33 is what it would round up to. Well, that's one hundredth of an hour they weren't getting overtime. He fought that fight for seven years. Everybody got a check finally for thirteen dollars. Huh? Yeah, making a big deal out of little things. Paul Day, my mentor and the Future Farmers of America, always said, you know, that's pole vaulting over mouse turds. Oh, I loved it. We used to call him rat legs. He had these skinny little white legs with white fur on them, you know, and then his little socks. Oh, man, loved him all day. Anyway, sometimes we pace ourselves, but the rest of the organization is running, and we're walking. It puts us behind, mortgaging our future. And sometimes we're afraid of the unknown. <laughs> I just don't understand that at all, afraid of the unknown. You're creating the future. How could you possibly be afraid of it? You're in the position. You're in the industry. You have impact, you have influence. Being afraid of the unknown. Dr. Catherine Hornet did a study and found human beings are successful 95% of the time. 19 out of 20 times what you attempt, you attain. Could you imagine going to the casino where 19 out of 20 times you pull down the one-armed bandit, that's how it'd pay out. That's how you'd spend all your time, that's how you'd spend all your resources. That's almost the guaranteed return we get when we invest in ourselves. I used to tell people for years to invest in a good library. And it was Erwin Jacobs uh, was getting the Minnesota Entrepreneur of the Year Award. And I joined the club just so I could meet him. And he's talking at the front of the room. This had been about 20 years ago. And he says, I'm sure you read the papers. They estimate I'm worth maybe 500 million, 600 million. But he says, I'll tell you what, I still bet the farm. 
and I might lose everything by the time I retire. But I had done this for my children. And that is, I put together the 20 books they need to read to be successful in this country. And that's what they'll get for sure from me, a good library. And I sat there thinking, God, wouldn't that stink? Huh? The old man was worth 500 million? <laughs> and then he blows it, and then I get a box of books? <laughs> I used to tell people, you know, make sure you invest 5% of your gross income in a good library. And, and I always said gross income because there were years I didn't have a net income. And I wanted to make sure I was practicing what I was preaching. But this is what always stuns me. I office out of my home for the first year, first 15 years of my career because nobody came to my office. And then the kids are in a funny age there for a while where it was impossible for me to work out of the home. So I bought an old saloon that went out of business because of the smoking ban in the, the Twin Cities. And I got a great deal at it. I bought a 4,000 square foot saloon that I converted to my office. So for five years I had a 4,000 square foot office with a 30 foot bar running through it and a dance floor. I mean, it was fantastic. And then five years went by, and all of a sudden I was adding something up. I said, good Lord, this cost me a lot of money. I got 150 grand into just using this building, and nobody ever comes to my office. So in April, I put it up for lease. My property manager got it leased up. I moved out, and I'm back home in my home office. And I moved my library into the lower level of our home, and I have a little over 2,200 books because my, my, my wife made me count them in, in my personal library. And when people come downstairs, because they always say, Kit, where's your office, downtown? I go, no, <laughs> downstairs. <laughs> oh, you have a home office? Let's go see it. Nah, let's go see it. Nah, you know, it's like anybody else's office. They'll go downstairs, I'll hit the lights, and there's one wall full of book, bookcases. And they'll stop and they'll say two things. One will say, <laughs> one will say, where'd you get all these books? Isn't that fantastic? Where'd you get all these books? I don't know why that just, I think that's so funny. And then somewhere in the conversation, I'll mention something about a bookstore, you know? <laughs> you know? And then, you know, the second question they'll ask, have you read all these books? And so I'll say, well, let's take a look, you know. These first two shelves, uh, those are books on change. Those bottom two shelves are on customer service. This next shelf is on customer service. Those next two shelves are on dealing with difficult people. The next shelf is on gender communication, this shelf and this shelf on gender communication, then it's generational communication. So they're in order by topic and by title. So what are you interested in? And they don't know. 2,200 books I think everybody should read, and they can't pick out one. This is a frightening statistic. The, uh, what is it, American Booksellers, and oh, what's that little, you know, Berkeley, that little college in California, Berkeley, did a study. This is what they found. One study was 58%, the other was 68% of adults in the workforce in this country have not read another book in its entirety since high school. Does that scare anybody? Less than 25% of the adults currently employed, currently employed in this country, have even been in a bookstore in a library in the last five years. For you to be accused of having or recognized as having relevant expertise, you have three years experience because the average turnover in this country is less than that now, and you've read three books specifically about what it is that you do because nobody else is reading. How long would it take to read three books? Three weeks, three months? Hey, it's a new job, live it up, you can take three years. <laughs> We have the finest library system in the world. Any book you request is required by law to order it for you. It's free. This is what always blows me away, too, though, that 41% of adults in this country that have a four-year college degree have not read another book in its entirety since high school either. So I tell you what, there's no sense to be intimidated. <laughs> You uh, need to just dig out the information, read it for yourselves, find it. But it's available and put it into practice and lead change in your industry. So that's one of the things we make a mistake, making a big deal out of little things. Sometimes we take the eye off the ball and sometimes we're not as effective as we could be. Psychologically disengaging from our work where you start to hear yourself talking, saying I have to, I need to, I must, I should do this, I should do that. Instead, say, I get to, I want to, I look forward to. Can you imagine the difference of, I, oh, I, I have to take that class at Energy U? Or if you say, I get to take that class at Energy U? 
change your attitude, it changes your actions, it changes your values and your beliefs and the enthusiasm you have. And then trying to get all the answers, you know, well, they're still making it up, whether it's your state capital or in Washington, D.C. or the EPA or whatever regulatory agent you have to deal with regularly. So what do we need to do? Well, what I'd like you to do is some new work behaviors, set goals and take action. I'm sure you've all heard that smart goal thing, specific, measurable, A. You often say achievable, but not with change. It has to be action-oriented. That old idea of ready, aim, fire, you know, no longer applies. It has to be ready, fire, aim. <laughs> Have an idea, take action, apologize. <laughs> Have an idea, take action, get some feedback. Have an idea, take action, get, modify it. We need to be more action-oriented. Don't leave the scene of a decision without taking action. Make the phone call, send out the email, text the message, make it happen. Just what's the next step? Action-oriented. It's a lot easier to act our way into a new way of thinking than sitting around sipping coffee trying to think our way into a new way of action. You just take action. Do it now, do it now, do it now. But sometimes we procrastinate. There's three reasons we procrastinate. One is catastrophic failure. We call catastrophic fantasy. Yeah, fantasy would be the better answer because it's not failure because you didn't even do anything. We think about what's the worst thing that could possibly happen when we don't do it. Well, that's not catastrophic failure. It's fantasy. The other one is perfectionist. Now, those of you that are, perfect, uh, are perfectionists as well, do it right the first time or don't do it at all. Do it right the first time. Well, I'll see you at my procrastination management seminar. <laughs> no. Do it right the first time and don't do it at all. That's what I'm a little surprised that I do this for a living. <laughs> it was one time, <laughs> back in 1995, I remember like it was yesterday, I gave a perfect presentation. It was three hours at District 622, Maplewood, Oakdale, North St. Paul School District, on interpersonal communication skills for three hours. I wanted to take a break every hour on the hour, and I'd say, it's time for us to take a break, and I'd take a look at my watch, and the second hand would be just sweeping by me as exactly an hour. I never got tongue-tied for three hours. Everything I wanted to say, I remembered and I said. Everything that was supposed to be funny <laughs> was hilarious. Everything they were supposed to take seriously, they wrote down notes. 30 people in the class, 30 evaluations, 30 tens. It was perfect. And I remember grabbing my briefcases and I walked out underneath the awning. I took a look to see if there was a cloud in the sky thinking for sure I was going to get hit by lightning. I don't know if I'd watched Caddyshack too many times, but I thought it might be it. I looked a half a dozen times before I crossed the road, thinking for sure I was going to get run down in the road. I drove exactly 55 miles an hour on my way home. My hands were trembling. It was so uncomfortable to give a perfect presentation, I made sure it never happened again since. <laughs> and it hasn't. Oh, what a relief. <laughs> Sometimes we deal with something called overgeneralization when it comes to change. The, we have a new form we have to fill out, or there's some new document that we have to you know, fill out. And the first time we work on it, we make seven mistakes, and we think, oh, I'm so stupid. No, you're not stupid. You wouldn't be in the career you're in. You wouldn't be in the positions you're in if you're stupid. Okay, it's a form that isn't very clear, right? But you say, wow, you know, I made seven mistakes. I'll never, and the next month you have to fill it out, and you go, oh, I hate that form. It's a pain pleasure principle. I made seven. So this time you make four mistakes, and you say, like, I hate it. I hate it. So bad at filling out that form. We haven't even noticed that for the last eight months, you filled it out accurately with no mistakes, but every time you think about filling out that form, it's like, ah, I hate that form. Overgeneralization. That's when I'm surprised I do this for a living too. 32 years ago, I was in high school in a play called The King and I. Now, I don't know if you ever had to sit through that play or sit through that movie with Yule Brenner. But I was the king in that play, and there's lines in the play where the king shouts at the school teacher, if I shall sit, you shall sit. Guess what I said opening night? Now, we joked about it in dress rehearsal, but mm, I just sent it sailing there opening night. 220 people in the little theater in St. James going, Ooh. <laughs> Pam Hansen tried to stay in character. She had tears running down her cheeks. I stormed off the stage, I'm like, ah. Play was sold out the next three nights. <laughs> but two years ago, I'm back at my high school class reunion, and that had to be at least 15, I should have counted, that came up and said, remember in that play when you got, <laughs> I do, yeah, anytime I get around words that start with S and SH, I remember that. 
So sometimes we have that pain pleasure principle. You're just going to have to push through it and develop that image of a person that moves change along. Now, when we talk about developing image, one of the best books I ever read was a book called Reaching Out, Interpersonal Effectiveness and Self-Actualization, written by Dr. David W. Johnson. And on a single page, he had this list called the six criteria of personal credibility, the six things we need to put in place to be leaders in our organization. Now, there are no particular order. According to his research, if we're lacking in any one of these qualities, we're lacking credibility. First one was consistently appear warm and friendly. Consistently appear warm and friendly. So let's say that we all got up and kind of shuffled over here and all we did was look down here on the trade show floor. And watch people, well nobody's walking by right now, but imagine we were watching people walk by and all we're going to do is observe them to determine whether or not they appear warm and friendly. So we're standing here looking at them and, and we go, nope, nope, ooh, no. Hey, there's one. Ah, there's another one. How can we tell? What gives those people away that they appear warm and friendly? Yeah, they have a pleasant look on their face. They might even be smiling, of all things. And if we're all standing here looking down there and they look up, what would they do? Yeah, they smile. You know, make eye contact rather than avoid it. If they recognize you, what would they do? Psst, yeah, whisper away. What's the out-of-pocket expense of appearing warm and friendly? Nothing. It's free. I have no idea what it costs us if we're not. It's one of the six criteria of being credible as a human being. Key word on that one, though, is consistently. Because I don't know if you've ever worked with difficult people. But let's say you get back to work on Monday and you show up and get out of the truck and you're all warm and friendly. What do difficult people think? What's your problem? What do you want? Huh? Did you go to one of those motivational speakers or something? <laughs> Or let's say you have been warm and friendly. One day next week, you go straight to task. No friendly chit-chat with anybody. Ooh, what do difficult people think now? Oh, what a grump. What a grouch. I bet they had a fight with their spouse. Oh, I bet it's their teenager. They'll just make it up. So the key is to be consistently warm and friendly. It's not that you walk in every day high-fiving and back-slapping and saying how great it is to work together every day. But nobody worries who showed up today, the happy person or the unhappy person. Then you tell people your intentions and motives. I'll call you at 10 o'clock. I'll stop by at 3 o'clock. I'll send you that email this afternoon before I leave. And you do. So you tell people what you're going to do, and then you follow through. Majority of people find you to be trustworthy. They'd be standing by the phone knowing you're going to be calling, standing there knowing you're going to stop by. And then you're an information source. You go to Energy U. You gather the information. You read the trade journals. You keep track of the articles. To the point you develop relevant expertise that in certain areas in your job, in your career, what you do, people seek you out for the answers rather than wasting their time talking to anybody else. And then the last on there's list was dynamism, natural enthusiasm. Dynamism isn't that you're doing calisthenics and jumping jacks in between meetings or installations, or, you know, but dynamism is when you walk in a room, the lights get a little bit brighter rather than a little bit dimmer. When you come to work, people are happy to see you rather than resenting the fact you showed up again today. And they're all free. I have a question for you. It's not a trick question. It's a mathematical equation. Be careful with your answers. What's 3 times 3? Careful now. What's 3 times 3? Go ahead. 9. Thank you. The reason I'm so careful about that is not too long ago I had somebody shout out 6. and That's hard to respond to. <laughs> so 9's a great answer. What's 5 times 5? 25. You're awfully good at this. What's 6,842 times 3,875? That's a lot. That's a lot, isn't it? Now, if I gave you those numbers and you all wrote them down, you could all give me the answer, couldn't you? Why? Why? Because you know the formula. I bet 50 years on this. That's the formula. To get an organization through change, to help an organization that's going through tremendous chaos, some people got to stay and then they're going to go, but we got to make sure they stay until that last day until they got to go. You just keep showing up, being warm and friendly. Tell people what you're going to do and do it. Know your stuff to the point you know more about that than anybody else, and you do it in a dynamic, humane way. XL Energy was uh, going to shut down that coal fire plant, that high bridge plant just west of downtown. For two years, the safety committee invited me in quarterly, met with all the staff because we needed everybody there until we shut it off. So everybody in the coal yard need to stay there until we shut it off. Everybody that is in maintenance and facilities management need to be there until we shut it off. And they fired up the switch on the new one. 186 employees 
firing up the new one less than 50. So 130 people are either going to have to go to another power plant, they're going to have to go back to school, learn a new career, form new relationships, going to have to retire earlier, deal with the humiliation and embarrassment of being the kid that didn't keep their job there. And the other ones are going to have to go back to school to try to figure out how to run this billion dollar power plant with all this new technology. So we met quarterly and we talked about, you know what's going to happen, you're going to go through grief. It's not the change, it's the grief. It's the feelings of the losses because you love working together. You, you look forward to seeing each other. You got a community here. And we know the signs of grief. You know, the first is, you know, you're, you're going to deny it. I, I bet they'll keep both plants running. No, oh, we're in the shadow of that one. Mm, no, they're not. They have one license. It's going to be here, you know. And, and then you'll get angry about it. Doggone it, you know. Why has it got to happen to us? And why, why are so many people going to have to have to, well, everybody's going to have to change. They get angry about it. And then you start to bargain, you know. What about if we in, increase the output? What about if we get more, get, get, you know, what if we, you know. No, you know, then, then you get anxious. Oh, my God, you know, am I going to get through it? Am I going to be able to stay? Am I going to have to form new relationships? And then, you know, people start to get disoriented. Part of that stress of kind of feeling out of sorts in that neutral zone. And then people get sad. And they get depressed. And I said, we know those seven stages. And I met with them on Mondays, and I said, you could, you know, drag it out the rest of your life, or you could drag it out for the next couple of years. Or I have an idea, how about this? We go ahead today and uh, deny it. <laughs> then tomorrow, <laughs> you get angry about it, <laughs> okay? And then Wednesday, you try to bargain, you know, see if there's some special deal you can cut. And then on Friday, you know, go ahead and get anxious before the weekend. You know, but I think if we just get in and out of those stages one a day, you know, for the next seven days, you'll have this thing wrapped up by Thursday next week. Because it isn't going to change anything, really. It's going to happen. Why drag it out for the rest of your life? Why waste that emotional energy? I mean, we know the stages. Get in there. Experience it. Get out of there. Quick change artists. One of the other things I'd like you to do is think of yourself as a consultant. I love being a consultant. Walking into organizations and say, you know that? I'd probably stop that. You know? That? You know, I've seen different organizations do that differently. They do it this way. Instead, you might want to consider that. And uh, no. <laughs> and uh, and then, uh, then I leave. I care, mm, but not that much. So when you're going through change, I want you to see yourself as a consultant. Here's an opportunity. Here's something else. You know, I noticed this too. And you go home. A little circle of influence. Remember we talked about, you know, reputation and employment and property. The one we didn't talk about is health, which is a stress aspect. But the little circle of influence is you just keep showing up. You honestly tell people what you think and feel present. And then you let go and you go home. Next day you show up, tell everybody honestly what you think and feel. And then be present, listen, let go and go home. It's pretty much all we can do. See yourself as a consultant and make suggestions. If you see a problem, make a suggestion. Ask questions, make a suggestion. Become a good failer, not failure, failer. Ask, make suggestions, fail. Ask, make suggestions, fail. I'm on a thought leaders group with a sales and marketing executives group, and we are doing kind of a book club. We had uh, Blink that we went back and reviewed, and Blink was talking about this thin slicing where you should really have somebody on your team that doesn't really know anything about what you do, and they'll say, well, what about this? And it's like, ah, well, yeah, I never thought of that. Our 20-year-old daughter is a development and cognitively disabled. She runs at about a 66 IQ. But what's amazing is how, <laughs> when I'm working at home, she goes, why do you do it that way? You could do it this way instead. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> that's a pretty good idea. She sees it so innocently, so openly. She doesn't have a dog in the fight. She just points it out. I'm not going to pay her a consulting fee, but... Uh, <laughs> But she just has that ability to see things I can't see. Now, when it comes to that image on a daily basis, how people determine how they're going to act and respond to you when you're going through tremendous change happens quickly. There's a great book called uh, Secrets of Successful Speakers. It claims half the impact and how you perceived me this morning occurred in the first five minutes. For the entire hour we spent together, half the impact on how you perceived me occurred in the first five minutes. Doo. How'd you perceive me in the first five minutes? Jacket on button, hands in my pockets. I said, thank you, Todd, for that flattering introduction. Can't wait to hear what I have to say. And then uh, Socrates, they poisoned him. I love saying that. But anyway, how'd you perceive me in the first five minutes? This is where we have the lively interaction between the speaker <laughs> and the participants. How'd you perceive me in the first five minutes? 
jacket unbuttoned, hand in my pocket, saying a few silly things. Oh, bring it on. Uh, Stephanie and I have a contract. What do you got? <laughs> Friendly. Confident. Competent or confident? I'll take either one. <laughs> Keep going to these. Let's say instead I started my jacket button. I said, good morning. My name is Kip Welchel, and today I'll be sharing with you some strategies and techniques that will work if you put them to work. Now, how do you perceive me? Stiff? Stuffy? Still confident? Maybe arrogant? Yeah, if I want any opinions, I'll tell you mine. <laughs> I love saying that. It's kind of naughty, but I love saying that. So I think, wow, the jacket's kind of formal. Looks kind of stuffy, button, kind of sloppy unbuttoned. So I think maybe what I'll do instead, because it's kind of warm outside. The air conditioning was kicking in. I don't know how, what the temperature is going to be like. So I think maybe what I'll do instead of wearing that jacket, I'll just go ahead and start by putting on the sweater. So instead, I start by saying, good morning. My name is Kit Welchland. Today, I'll be sharing with you some strategies and techniques that will work if you put them to work. Now, how do you perceive me? Mr. Rogers, uh, going to be some real hard-hitting information, huh? You'd be afraid of it, I'll move it to your neighborhood. <laughs> so I think that sweater is kind of silly, the jacket's kind of formal, so I think maybe what I'll do instead is I'll just go ahead and start in my shirt and tie. So instead I start by saying, good morning, my name is Kit Welchland, and today I'll be sharing with you some strategies and techniques that will work if you put them to work. Now how do you perceive me? I mean, hard work, isn't it? I hope you registered. It's going in your personnel file whether or not you attended this session. It's going to be a little harder hitting all of a sudden, isn't it? So I did is put on a jacket, put on a sweater, roll up my sleeves. For the most part, all I did was change clothes. But it instantly, instantly changes the way you perceive me. And I'm not kidding. In a Princeton University study, they found it may take less than 100 milliseconds, a tenth of a second, to form an impression of another person to decide whether or not he or she is attractive, trustworthy, competent, and likable. Tenth of a second. It takes two tenths of a second time to change a facial expression. We're late. <laughs> a tenth of a second. Less time than it takes to form a rational thought. Listen to that list. Attractive, trustworthy, competent, and likable. If it took 10 years to be accused of that, it'd be worth it. Tenth of a second. So as leaders, managers of your industry, supervisors, you're going to have to lead the charge, push change along, show them how to get through it, use the principles and share the principles that I shared with you, and put it into action. It used to be that old thing, they say it only takes one minute to change my attitude, but in that minute, change my entire day. That might be your whole life. Bottom line is this. If I was an actor, I get paid to play a role. Guess what? At work, we get paid to play a role. Let's say I didn't make my living giving speeches and seminars, but let's say that uh, I made my living as an actor, and this was some sort of Shakespearean play, and I'm an actor in that play, and you have $50 tied up in your seat there to sit through that play, and yeah, I don't want to do it today. Okay, I don't want to put on the little booties. I don't want to put on the tights. I don't want to put on the frilly shirt, and I don't want to bound across stage. But you have $50 tied up in your ticket, and I'm on stage doing this. <laughs> to be or not to be, that's the question. Where art thou? <laughs> Would you feel like you got your money's worth? Nah, you demand your money back. If I was an actor, I'd get paid to play a role. Guess what? At work, you get paid to play a role. You know all the characters. Just giving you all your lines and all your stage directions to become a quick change artist and lead your organization and help the people that you lead and care about do it on a daily basis and get home safely. Now, if you have any questions anytime on anything I talked about this morning, you just feel free to contact me, call me, email me, tweet me, whatever you'd like to do. And I will call you back, and I'll share any of the information over the phone with you free. It's not a big deal. I only get one call like that a week. <laughs> but it's the least I can do if you've been trapped in this room with me for an hour. Great working with you. Have a wonderful conference. And thank you, Todd, for that nice introduction. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.
Thank you, Kit. That was terrific. Kit, on behalf of the MEA and the great folks of the ener energy industry here today, please accept our thanks and appreciation for joining us today in Iowa State. That was great. Um, once again, let's give Kit a big round of applause. That was a great job. It wasn't by coincidence we've had him here today. He had examples of our change for our transition to Rochester and that absent-minded guy to get in the milk, me. <laughs> I think I took my ginkgo biloma this morning, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> this includes a keynote speaker session. Please visit our associated members, um, companies on the floor. Lunch will be served here today and tomorrow, and our classes today start at 1 o'clock. Let's enjoy the MEA 90, 89th, excuse me, 89th Annual Operations Technical and Leadership Summit. And our 90th year will be in Let's Knock It Up a Rock, or Let's Knock It Up a Notch in Rock. I mean, we'll get it figured out sometime. But thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>